Oh, I'm still training myself to look at the, what is that thing called? Camera? <laughs> Instead of down at the people. So I have to imagine all the zoomers through the camera, which is what I'll do. It's good to be here with you all, Jelly Graph, um, which I, you probably know, because I said that two weeks ago. So we will um, begin the way we normally do by chanting the refuges and precepts, uh, just the refuges. So if you need um, to look at that, there's some folders in the closet there. Michelle, would you grab a handful of, of the chant books in case folks need them? And don't be shy, just grab one. And if you're on Zoom, I just typed the refuges into the chat for everybody. So we'll begin by acknowledging our teacher, the Buddha. <clears throat> we'll chant this Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa three times. <clears throat> then move right into chanting the refuges. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato. Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Udam Saranam Gachami Dhamam Saranam Gachami Sangam Saranam Gachami Dutiampi Buddham Sarnam Gachami Dutiampi Dhamam Sarnam Gachami Dutiampi Sangam Sarnam Gachami Tatiyam pi budam sarnam gachami. Tatiyam pi damam sarnam gachami. Tatiyam pi sangam sarnam gachami. Just finding ourselves into a comfortable posture. Just breathe in and out. An awareness of the body. Remembering the simplicity of practice.
This body is such a great teacher. We don't need anything more. Inviting the heart to feel into the body. Meeting whatever, whatever's obvious. Remembering that we're not running towards anything or trying to get away from anything. We're just accepting. Accepting what's already here. Allowing this conditioned experience the way this life is expressing itself to be our teacher. And setting down any ideas of what it's like to be a good meditator. Just feeling into the body breath by breath, moment by moment. We're looking at the body through wise view. It's just this. Nowhere to go, nothing to do. Feel into this. With the heart that understands it's just nature. Each experience coming and going with its own forces. Not self, not me, not mine. Conditions supporting the arising of this. And when those conditions cease to exist, so does this. What a relief it is not to have to make anything happen or to be in charge or in control. We can just rest. And feel.
And in some moments, the energy will be just right for feeling into this. And in some moments, we'll notice some agitation or restlessness on one end. We might notice some sluggishness or dullness on the other end. We can remember that these either ends it's just an expression of nature. No need to take this personally either. Restlessness is just expressing its nature, having arisen because the conditions were right. The same is true for sleepiness. So once again, we look, we receive restlessness, we receive sleepiness through wise view. Low energy states are just like this. Dullness, it's just this. Is it possible to be interested to be curious to not have to be in control to accept this too as just a force of nature Just like anything else, this gets to be my teacher. Can I learn how not to be perfect, but to just be a learner and receive any experience as a teacher? Let's continue in silence now.
Feel free to take a minute to stretch your legs, even step away from your screen for a minute if you'd like to do that. So we're working our way through the five hindrance and hindrances in this fall Buddhist studies class, which I always really love the topic of the hindrances because I start to feel really normal. Oh, I get this. <laughs> this is the territory that I live in so much of the time, and so do you. You're visited by the hindrances quite often. A couple of weeks ago, Mark said, and Mark likes to say that desire is the animating force of life. And I think I mentioned that Gil Fronstall said that desire is the caffeine of the soul. Actually, I'll read a little bit from Gil. He says that this is not it's not surprising that weariness often follows from bouts of excessive desire and ill will. Sometimes this is simply because prolonged states of each is exhausting. Right? So it makes sense that these three um, expressions of life show up in the same list because often we don't know what's happening behind the scenes. We don't know that the mind is getting tired out by not being mindful, really. Getting tired out by all of the wanting or all of the not wanting. And then we find ourselves into this, like a mindful moment where we, we aim to be present and intimate and yet all the mind wants to do is just fall asleep. Right? Have you had that experience? You're like, okay, I'm ready now. I'm gonna sit down and be awake and alert. And the mind is just like whew, nodding, 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 nodding. Or maybe you've had this moment where the mind is like, I, this has happened to me quite often, where the mind flips between, it seems like it's just swinging from one end to being restless and worried. And then, you know, there's like a moment of present and, and that's it. The mind just goes to sleep, right? Has it happened to you too before? Yeah. It's like there's no middle, right? Well, that's just, it seems to be what Gil was pointing to in this beginning of this chapter is that the mind just really gets tired from what's happening there. The activity of mind is actually tiring it out. So we can begin our consideration of sloth and torpor as uh, we can look through, we can look to these expressions um, at, through, the, through the lens of wise view, which is what I was pointing us to in the instructions in the meditation. And wise view really helps us not take things personally. So when, when the mind is full of wisdom or even has just a drop of wisdom, then life becomes a little bit more tolerable. We become a little bit more courageous. Without wisdom, life can feel <clears throat> unbearable, right? It's intense, it's hard, there's a lot coming at us, there's so much confusion. And if, it's, if that's all we're seeing, suffering, confusion, stimulation, ah, uh, right, it becomes hard to bear. But wisdom allows us to understand that, oh, this is just this, right? When we're receiving experience, we're receiving it with wisdom, like, oh, this isn't my fault, or this isn't a personal attack, or life doesn't have to be a problem in any way. Because I know, I know something here. I know that this, what I'm experiencing right now, is a result of causes and conditions. It's not because I did something right or did something wrong, right? I, I'm not a failure here because I'm sleepy. Sleepiness arose because the conditions were right for it to arose, arise. And in fact, we're swimming in history in this very moment, right? All that we're experiencing right now has been seeded in previous moments. And so this understanding like, oh, this is just nature. That's what we mean by nature. It's just 
this moment couldn't be anything other than the way it is because of that, because of conditionality, right? It's like the weather or the temperature, the ground, the leaves falling off the trees couldn't be other than the way they are given the confluence of conditions that have supported that. Right? So we can see these forces, all of the hindrances and in particular sleepiness or dullness, uh, sloth and torpor as a part of our humanness, a natural part of our humanness. And we meet the experience of sloth and torpor with right wise view. Often, if we're being honest, and this has been true for me, when sleepiness or dullness, some kind of fatigue in the mind arises, we have a response to that. And then it's not like, oh, this is nature. It's often like, what's wrong with me? Like, I'm not, why well, I've been practicing for like 5,000 years and I'm still sleepy. How can that be? Or I've been waiting all week and I was just awake. My listening jamming out on music and now I'm sleeping and I really want to be mindful like I hope nobody else sees me right doing this I'm such a failure that's tends to be our tendency so even in moments like this the good news is we can we always meet whatever's predominant so if the mind relates unwisely then noticing that unwise view is orienting in the direction of wise view again right? Because wisdom knows like, oh, even this condemnation or the shame that's arising is an expression of nature. Just have it energy. It's arisen because the conditions are right for it to arise. It's not a problem. It's not a personal failing. This is just life. This is the way it is for human beings, right? So we're never off the path. We can always reorient in the direction of wise view. If we try to get away from sleepiness, right? Wrong view here it's gonna have its way with us because we're just resisting. We're in contention with life as it is. And if we've tried to fight sleepiness, fight, you know, we can see the results, right? You don't need me to tell you because we've all done that or we'll do it at some point and then we can watch and see what happens. Does this support ease, intimacy, connection? Does it support a kind of wise and compassionate living? And we'll know the answer. So when we are able to be mindful and not take experience personally, when we're to, able to be mindful of sleepiness or dullness, we can start to see what we can learn from it. Instead of needing to get somewhere else, jump over it or run through it, we can start to see any experience, even this, as our teacher. Right? We don't see this very often, but we have a lot of preferences. We see this in our daily lives. We probably see all the preferences the mind has, like wanting this and not wanting that and, and such. But often in our meditation practice, it's not as visible to us. We don't know, like, oh, I have a preference for not sleepiness, or I have, an, I have a preference for calm, or I have a preference for not restlessness, or no doubt or something like that, a particular way of practicing. But when we're working with the hindrances, we can see how we're interested in getting what we want because the hindrances are a wonderful teacher like this to us. We often don't want them, any of them. We especially don't want sleepiness. We want a calm, settled mind. And it's actually not that simple. So we're asked to be, we're, we're being asked again and again and again to surrender to life as it is. And so dullness, sloth and torpor, two different, two distinct states, but they arise together. Dullness can be a sign of not wanting to be in the world, right? It can really be natural and not something we have to demonize. Depression, for example, can be a form of dullness. And I notice this in my life sometimes that um, <clears throat> when life feels hard, you know, I just kind of, I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this, right? I don't really want to get up. I don't really need more sleep, but I kind of don't want to get up either. 
and I'd rather not go to work because it's hard and I'm, maybe I don't know what to do or things are going to be hard. I know they're going to be hard or complicated or taxing or something like that. And the mind just would rather like sink into some kind of apathy or disinterest or disengagement, right? And when we're meditating, sometimes meditation bring, brings up our deepest unresolved issues. So beyond just not wanting to be a part of the world, sometimes our whole system wants to naturally shut down, right? Or take a step back. Or maybe we feel some unpleasant emotion, right? That's there, or maybe some intense emotion. And the mind just naturally wants to get dull around it. And so this is just more reason to not, not try to make ourselves into perfect practitioners, but to allow life to be our teacher. Because in these moments, we don't really want to, we don't want to push through that. We want to find our way to a compassionate connection, right? So that we're not making things harder, making things worse, or somehow, you know, not honoring the nature of life that's moving through us, that has moved through us, all of our history and experience and ancestry and all of that, right? This moment that we're having right now is an expression of that. So a way of honoring is like going, oh, sweetie, okay, you're, you're just kind of apathetic right now, or the mind is a little bit dull, or you're not into this right now, right? Or this isn't the right time to open to that. That's okay. Like I can, you can, you can do that. You can do you in this way, right? That would be a really wise way of relating to dullness, especially under these circumstances. So we want to apply some comfort and care. Being deluded, as we all are, is a lot easier in the short run. So it makes some sense that the mind can apply a confused strategy to the moment, right? So even if we know like, oh, I, I have the strength to be here with this difficult experience, with this difficult emotion, and yet the mind is just going to sleep anyway, or the mind is checking out anyway. We have to honor the, the kind of deluded tendencies that are there because they're there for a reason. In the short term, you know, it's a bit easier. Life becomes a bit easier. Although what we learn from practicing and from engaging Buddhist practice is that in the long term, it doesn't make sense, right? And so we keep applying a bit of effort and energy to being mindful and training in this intimacy, knowing that it's not going to be like we want it to be in every single moment. We're not going to actually be intimate with our experience. What we're going to feel are all the dodges to that, all the deluded and confused ways of meeting life as it is. And that's okay, because that's how we learn. We just learn, the heart learns slowly with time. So what is sloth and torpor? <clears throat> and it's good to say that sloth and torpor aren't the same thing as physical tiredness. So we're talking about mental qualities here. Sometimes we're just tired and maybe we don't know the difference, and so we can check it out by lying down to get some sleep or take a nap, and we can see if the body's tired, then the body will be able to go to sleep. But this sloth and torpor is about uh, mental sluggishness. And sloth, if you imagine a sloth, the animal, the sloth, right, they just like really move slowly. I was listening to a, a talk, I think I sent it out by Joseph Goldstein, a podcast interview, and he was talking about the nature of sloths, and he said something like, uh, like a, you can shoot a gun really close to a sloth, and they won't even orient towards it, right? That's, they're just like, their nature is just a, right? And so when the mind is slothful, it, there's just this kind of sluggishness or consciousness, sluggishness of consciousness or energy. It's a, like a physical absence of vitality, and so although it's not a kind of physical tiredness that can be felt in the body, it might be felt as like a drooping or a heaviness or a weariness. And then <clears throat> torpor is a kind of sluggishness or weakened state of the mental factors. 
So when there's a lack of mental energy, right, there can be a, a drifting in and out of thought or a kind of soupy feeling that's there, or maybe like, <clears throat> sometimes we do, don't even know it. Like I'll arise from meditation. I'll go like, Oh, was that, was I aware? Or I don't really know. It seems like maybe like a dreamlike state was there or just kind of like very dull energy. It's hard to even feel the, the potency of mindfulness and it's easy to miss, right? So although these two arise together, they are somewhat different. <clears throat> to me, sloth and torpor feel like they've got a, a quality of, of like a wateriness to them. If you think of like wetness, it can, can it congeals, right? It can make things into, it can make flour into dough or just add a bit of water to anything in it, muddy, right? The mind can feel dense like that, like muddy or heavy or like that. So the first step in working with uh, sloth and torpor is to know that they're present. So we have to be able to acknowledge their presence and we have to be able to acknowledge their absence. So contrary to what we might believe about ourselves, we're not uh, swimming in hindrances 100% of the time, right? There are moments when the mind is quite awake and there are moments when the mind is dull. There are moments when the mind is really balanced. There's like a balance of energy. And then there are moments when there's restlessness or anxiety or worry, something like this. We tend to think from a point of view of self that I am just a depressed person, right? Or I am an anxious person. But that sense of I is like really at the heart of the Buddhist teachings. Like the Buddha said, oh, there's not, there's not a sense of I here, which just causes and conditions and experience that arise from causes and conditions. So sloth and torpor, when they're present, we know that they're present. And when they're absent, we know that they're absent. We don't have to do that extra move of claiming it and, and using it to create an identity from. And we have to know how to strategize, right? We have to know how to be with sloth and torpor and we have to know when the right move is to do something a little more uh, gross, right? We have to know when it's possible to watch sloth, to watch the mind be sleepy and we have to know when it's time to perhaps open our eyes or even stand up or even go for a walk, change the, the activity, right? And this takes some careful discerning. So we might wanna challenge ourselves to uh, be with it a little bit longer than we normally are because the tendency is often to apply a strategy a bit too soon, right? I remember being on a retreat. I have a wonderful teacher, Andrea Fella, and I really have to credit her for helping me learn how to work with sloth and torpor. She's really good at this and talked a lot about working with low energy in this way and really just normalize the experience, like the human experience of being sleepy or of being kind of like dull, right? And so for so much of that retreat, I just was really committed to watching dullness and sleepiness. And so I just like committed to not move. So I let myself nod and fall asleep as many times as I did, right? And it was amazing because there's so much to actually learn from that, right? I, I got to see some of the things I was just mentioning, like how easy it is to be ashamed of that or to think that I'm a bad meditator or to just like start the you know harsh judgment towards myself. And I also learned a lot of amazing things about like the capacity of the mind. Once mindfulness gets stronger and stronger, especially throughout a retreat, it's actually possible to be there. And mindfulness itself, you know, can be clear even when the experience is a dullness, right? It seems weird, but maybe you've experienced that already. But mindfulness can be like, oh yeah, this is dull, <laughs> right? Mindfulness itself isn't necessarily impacted by the dullness. 
It's just reflecting something that's here like, oh, there's not enough energy or look at that. It's kind of impressive. So we can also uh, be curious about some of the forces that are invisible to us. Like we, we probably, if I would ask everybody, like, do you want to be awake or do you want to be sleepy? Everybody would say, well, I'm here to meditate. I want to be awake, right? But in a moment when there's sleepiness or dullness, sometimes we actually, there's a wanting to lean into it, right? Because at least in moments, it feels good, right? Have you ever watched the mind fall asleep? Well, there's a pleasant hook that's there, right? That actually, actually grabs our attention. So I've, so many times I've like, you know, started to fall asleep and then, you know, woken up, meditating, and go, like, dang it, I really, like, I really want to be, but I was like, oh, no, you kind of don't, right? Look at that right there. It feels so good. There you go, like, ah, getting seduced just by that pleasant hook. And this, again, is nature, too, because we've learned something about pleasant experience. This is what happens with pleasant experience. We don't actually see the pleasantness, but we just get seduced and want to lean into it, right? That's the primary predicament that we're in as human beings. We want to hold on or lean into pleasant and we want to try to get away from what's unpleasant. So one support, right, when we're noticing this happen is just to go to the body and see if we can stay in the pleasantness, like to feel and to embrace the pleasantness, but to restrain the liking, right? restrain the wanting. Feel that, root, that tension right there. And then another tool to working with sloth and torpor is to notice the, you know, um, to notice the interest, right? Or the lack of interest. Because sometimes the mind can go to sleep when there's an imbalance of energy, let's say, right? We're always kind of, looking for that middle way where there's enough energy to be awake, but not too much energy that we're tense or restless, right? And if we're too relaxed, then we're just gonna be kind of disinterested. So we wanna find that nice middle between interest and relaxation. And if we're too relaxed, right, then the mind will just be not here. And if we're too interested, the mind will flip into some high energy state. So we can look for interest and see if it's possible because these sloth and torpor, remember our mental aspects of men the men mental of, uh, mind states. So we can see if it's possible to strengthen interest in the mind and see if that supports a more wakeful state. And there are lots of ways to do that. One way is to just practice like Sometimes it's just a nod to experience, or sometimes it can actually be a mental note, like just naming, not going on a long story about it. Like, oh, this is a thought about my sister. And remember when she did that? Like, some, you know, that's a story that's different than a thought. Oh, thinking is happening. Thinking is being known, right? And sometimes it doesn't even, we don't even need that mental note, but just a nod to it, right? And sometimes the body can be a good teacher in this way. We're just like tracking experience in the body. Warmth, pleasant, 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 neutral. Ah, look at that. Breathing in, breathing out. Just that, that kind of engaged mental capacity can actually stim stimulate some interest in mind. Sometimes there's this, there's this phenomenon called sinking mind where the mind is like, there, right? Notice we're being aware, being aware, then all of a sudden it seems to collapse, right? And that is be usually because there's more tranquility than interest. So that kind of noting rises, raises the mental energy 
enough to meet the tranquility. So if you find the mind just like collapsing quickly, surprisingly, sometimes it seems like it's out of the blue, it, it perhaps is because we're not noticing the mind is actually getting calm, right? There's a kind of calmness that's there or tranquility that's there. And that's good news. So if we can learn to recognize that and we don't have, then we don't have to see the sinking mind as a problem at all. We can just see it as a mind that's slightly out of balance. Oh, we need enough interest to balance the tranquility factor that's there. And sometimes, you know, we don't notice the kind of frustration that's there when we're feeling sleepy or when the mind is dull. And so we think like, I need a, I need a strategy. And we overcorrect, right, by doing something more intense, like some contemplation in the middle of a sit, or maybe we'll even get up out of the sit and do some rigorous walking, or this happens on retreat sometimes, I've, I've done this. Like, oh, the mind is just really dull, really sluggish. I need to raise the energy. But what I'm missing is that the energy is already there. It's just not accessible. And so then overcorrecting in these gross ways then peaks the energy too much. Right? And sometimes I don't notice that what's happening behind the scenes is there's, there's a lot of mental proliferation, like a lot of thinking. Or the mind is there's some like layer of... Um, limiting belief that's operating beneath the surface in the form of thought sometimes it's not even noticeable right and that is bringing the energy down it's depleting right and so sometimes bringing the energy doing something gross like going for a walk or going for a run then you know in combination the mind isn't we don't i don't really know that the mind isn't able to meet thought isn't able to see the subtlety of thought and now there's like we're tipping into too much exhaustion from all of that thinking and all of that kind of limiting belief storyline that's beneath the surface. Like I'm not good enough. I, I'll never be able to do this or what's wrong with me. I'm such a bad, blah, whatever the storyline is, right? That's just like depleting all the energy, all the vitality out of the spirit. All right. Talking quickly, cause I know we have small groups to get to. I want to get in one more thing, and that's, you know, that sometimes, uh, sometimes sloth and torpor can disguise itself in the form of self-compassion, right? So we might think, like, I, I find myself in this trap, maybe you know this too, that, like, oh, I really need this. I really need, you know, I've been working so hard, poor me, I've been doing so much, and I really need this time to just rest or, but I don't know that what's actually happening is the mind is trying to convince itself to check out, right? So there's like this disguise of like, I'm being good to myself, but what's actually happening is there's a little bit of delusion there, right? It's like, oh, you're not seeing it, right? You just want to get away. You don't want to do anything right now, right? And so being able to, uh, being able to notice, being able to be with the, the low energy, then allows for some of this, what's percolating beneath the surface to make itself known, right? Because the mind doesn't need a lot of mindfulness to actually connect with the way it is. And oftentimes we're trying a little bit too hard, right? So to back off of the trying and just see if it's possible to meet the level of energy without force. It's just, so the mind is dull instead of like trying to fix it or trying to convince myself that it's okay, then to really back off and to just go like, okay, how much effort does it take to actually be with this, right? And does it, how much, correction how much strategy does it take to be with this like do i need to open my eyes and take some couple of deep breaths or pull on my earlobes that's one of the strategies the buddha suggested just like tug on your ear or he actually suggests putting water on your face too do i need to get up and go do that or is it possible to just 
lean back a bit, maybe like just let a bit of light in, maybe not even, right? But just to see if there can be an adjustment that's made internally that meets the subtlety of the dullness with a little bit more compassion, a little bit more care. And with one few words from Gil. He says, mindfulness practice can help us understand how our evaluations and reactions lead to lethargy. We can see how the stories we tell ourselves drain our vitality. I can't do it, it's too hard, or it's too dangerous. As these thoughts lead to discouragement, self-pity, and ideas of futility, our vitality continues to disappear. Learning to be mindfully, learning to mindfully watch our thoughts instead of actively participating in them can entirely stop them from draining our energy, right? So sometimes we don't know the way the, the storyline beneath the surface that's connecting up with the experience of dullness is what's, is what's causing our suffering. So responding with a, a bit of why, through wise view, right, that understands like I don't have to make a problem of this. It's not a problem. Mindfulness doesn't need experience to be sharp. We just understand, oh, this is dullness. This is like this. Can there be a gentleness, a kind of um, care, a kind of caring heart that meets that experience without trying to make a problem of it or do something about it even? Okay. Well, those are my thoughts for tonight about sloth and torpor. Thanks for hanging with the pace. <laughs> we have time for small groups now. Let me see this for one second. And is anybody here? If you are here in the room to lead the small groups, would you raise your hand so I can see you? That's it. All right, Dave, there you are again, Dave. I'm going to transfer host to you. And it would just be good in your small groups to um, share your experience of dullness and sleepiness and what you've been learning as you've been working, as you've been getting to know these forces in the mind over the, the time that you've been practicing either in the last week or longer, right? And remembering that, yeah, the, when we're honest, when we're really honest, it's really in support of our own learning and in support of each other's learning, right? So it's okay if we feel like we're not good students because that's, you know, one of the traps of working with the hindrances is to think we have to be good students. So when we actually go like, oh no, I sat through every sit last week, I fell asleep for at least 20 minutes, like, that's real. That's, how, that's sometimes how it is. That's how it goes for us, right? Or I really don't, I don't know dullness because I try to avoid it at all costs. I always do something to make myself pick up the energy. That would actually be good to share because we're actually connecting with what's real for us. Okay. All right. So I hope you enjoy your conversations and we'll see you again next week. All right. Zoomers. And Dave, you're now host. <laughs>